Hi everyone, welcome back and welcome to video two, which is what we've missed, part two. So this course is largely um, dedicated to understanding invertebrate animal fossils, but I just wanted to highlight that vertebrates have also evolved, this shouldn't be a surprise to any of us, and that they've got a really interesting uh, fossil record. So I wanted to put in just a few slides highlighting some of the major events in vertebrate evolution that have happened over the 500 million, last 500 million years, because I thought they would be interesting, to be honest, so here they are. So. The reason that this course is explicitly invertebrate fossils is because these are most in com commonly encountered in the rocks that are, we working as geologists are interested in. Uh, most of the rock that we look at for things such as oil exploration or um, exploring for uh, uh, metal deposits, say, was deposited in a marine environment, so terrestrial fossils are relatively few and far between in those environments. They have to be washed in. This is not to say that vertebrates don't have a rich and interesting fossil record. Bones generally have a high preservation potential, so they're not particularly unusual as fossils in the right depositional environments, i.e. those on land. And there are a great many things that we can say about vertebrate evolution when it comes to looking at the fossils. So some basics, here you can see a series of different groups of vertebrates here. In fact, they were all from the liquid tetrapods. I didn't put any fish in. Apologies, that would have been cool, but there you go. Um, vertebrates are characterized by having skeletons that are made of bone. This is this nice kind of appetite um, mineral structure that we use as our endoskeleton. Um, to provide support. The origins and evolution of the skeleton is marked by a lot of research currently. There are some major questions regarding um, skeleton and in particular bone evolution, and they're really, really interesting, but I'm not gonna cover them today. Rather, what I'm going to cover is um, first the phylogeny um, element of this just in the broadest sense possible, and then we're gonna look at some major events in vertebrate evolution. So when it comes to the vertebrates, the vertebrates are part of a large group that includes the chordates. So that includes, that is the chordates, which you can see on this particular uh, tree here. We and all other vertebrates and chordates are a member of this clade called the deuterostomes, defined by embryology uh, and some other aspects of the, uh, the biology of these creatures. And all of us are bioterian animals. So that's where we are on our evolutionary tree. And so let's have a quick look at vertebrate evolution. The oldest vertebrates in the fossil record with which we have any um, certainty at all are small jawless fish-like creatures that appear in the early Cambrian of China. These are shown on the left here. So there has been, the case has been made, that these represent the earliest representatives of the vertebrates. They have, uh, people have identified uh, things like uh, the notochord within these fossils. Since that point, uh, the vertebrates have evolved through jawless forms into jawed fish. And by the Devonian period, armored fishes with jaws um, were abundant in seas and lakes uh, during uh, the period up to the Devonian, um, there were quite a few. There was quite a wide range of diversity of forms of jawless fish as well. But um, those today are not diverse at all. There are very few members of clades which represent our jawless fishes today. After the Devonian period, cartilaginous and bony fish, fishes. This is a major division within the fish, diversified in numerous bursts. I wanted to highlight at this point the existence of conodonts. These are the structures shown in the middle here. And these are tooth-like elements that are useful in biostratigraphy. They're relatively common in rocks from the Paleozoic period. These, these guys go extinct at the end of the um, Triassic period, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and uh, other fish teeth and scales, things called ichthy ichthyoliths, are also relatively common. Um, during the Paleozoic. Tetrapods, so that's things with four legs that nowadays um, uh, many, many taxa live on land, um, evolved during the Devonian period within the lobed finned fish. So essentially everything alive on land today with four limbs is just a highly derived bony fish. 
bear that in mind. That's all we are. Um, the example that I've put on the right here, this super smiley um, example, is a reconstruction based on a CT scan of the late Devonian amphibian called Ichthyostega. Sorry. Um, swallowing my words there. This is a, a one of a series of iconic taxa that, that look like they um, they kind of chart the movement of um, tetrapods onto land to become increasingly um, uh, independent of watery environments. Fish-eating amphibians diversified in the Carboniferous period um, and the first reptiles uh, appear um, shortly uh, after this and those were small insect eaters. I forget the exact date of the first reptiles at the moment but um, we're always finding earlier discoveries so it's so somewhere um, around the Carboniferous. Uh, a group called the Synapsids, this is a group that's actually defined on skull morphology, um, there's a Wikipedia article that's fairly reliable if you want to learn more about them or I can highly recommend Mike Burton's vertebrate paleontology textbook that's available in the library if you want to get into a bit more detail still. Um, the, so these, this group, the synapsids, dominated ecosystems on land in the Permian and the Triassic. But they were heavily hit by the end Permian mass extinction. So this is a massive extinction that occurred at 252 million years ago that wiped out, out, to, wiped out up to 96% of all living species at that time. And after that, diapsid reptiles, in particular the dinosaurs, rose to become the dominant tetrapods on land during the Mesozoic. Here we are with some examples of our diapsids. And post the Permian-Triassic uh, extinction at 252 million years ago, this massive event that wiped out many, many animal species, and other species for that matter, diapsid reptiles in particular diversified in the late Triassic. On the top left here, you can see a example of a Triassic archosaur. So the archosaur is the clade whose living members encompass what we call reptiles and the birds. The dinosaurs were a hugely successful group for 165 million years of the Mesozoic. Other important groups uh, existed too, and these include uh, the crocodilians, such as this a creature shown in the image here. This is a late Jurassic crocodilian. Pterosaurs were key Mesozoic vertebrate flyers. So you can see an example here on the bottom left. These were diapsids as well. And the most important marine reptiles were the plesiosaurs and the ichthyosaurs. So really reptiles were just, they were just doing really, really well during this time period. The birds evolved from within the dinosaurs, so birds are just derived dinosaurs. Shown here are examples of the Cretaceous theropod dinosaurs. So the top shows Deinonychus, 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 sorry, that should have been Deinonychus, <laughs> um, and the bottom shows Tyrannosaurus. So this is the group from within which the birds evolved, however slightly before these creatures were around. And this image here shows the earliest bird, Archaeopteryx, which is from the late Jurassic. The birds as a group then radiated, particularly during the tertiary period, so more recently than, um, than, the, uh, the, than the kind of their origins, should we say. The first mammals, and mammals are synapsids, um, were small insect eaters that were around in the latest Triassic period. The group as a whole only achieved great diversity and abundance after the dinosaurs went extinct. So we had a long period where um, mammals were around, but they weren't particularly successful. So we've got evidence from both fossils and from the DNA of living creatures that suggests that modern mammals radiated in the late Jurassic and the early Cretaceous. If you want uh, some insights as to how we can use the DNA of living creatures to tell us that, do feel free to uh, ask me in the Zoom session. I would happily explain this thing that's called the molecular clock. We know that significant splits within the mammals were often um, fairly geographic in their nature. Major clades separated from each other in South America, Africa, Australasia, and in the Northern Hemisphere. So we've got this kind of um, fairly geographic picture of evolution of the mammals. Uh, humans rose between uh, 8 and 6 million years ago, and fossil evidence points to repeated human migrations out of Africa. 
So that is vertebrate evolution in a very, very small nutshell. That's some major events. If you are interested in this and you find it exciting and interesting, I would just like to take this opportunity to highlight that at the moment we offer modules in both vertebrate, uh, in particular dinosaur paleobiology in our third year courses and in primate evolution, so the origin of humans and their, their, their relatives, that you can sit in your final year if you so wish. Again, if you have questions about those, ask me in the Zoom session and I can happily answer all of your questions. And I wanted to move on outside the animals to highlight a few things that we've missed, but are really, 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 really important. So these are not animals, but um, are things that we should be aware we can find as fossils and indeed are very, very useful to us as fossils. The first of these are the plants, and these are the primary producers of all land-based ecosystems. So the basis of how the ecosystems in which we live um, uh, are built. So they, they take energy from, uh, from the sun and use it to create stuff that heterotrophs like us, like other animals, tend to eat. They really deserve to be in their own lecture, I should highlight, but we've only got a limited amount of time to cover within this particular unit. The study of fossil plants falls into two disciplines. That's how, how big a group this is. Uh, the first is paleobotany, which concentrates on macroscopic fossils, so those which are visible with the naked eye, um, and the remains of those plants. And then the second kind of field that is largely plants is a thing called palynology. This is mainly the study of pollen and spores that can be re removed from a rock um, using really strong acids, well it depends on the rock, but using acid, um, pollen and spores are often left over as residues when you dissolve a rock, as studying them provides remarkable insights into paleo environments and biostratigraphy. So this is once more an example of micropaleontology and this is why that split exists in the study of fossil plants between those two, because one has traditionally been uh, a thing you study with microscopes, so micropaleontology, the other one has been hand specimens, so it's been paleo paleontologists as a whole. So the origins of plants as a whole lie in the freshwater green algae and their relatives. And we have a rich fossil record of plants which can allow us to say an awful lot about the evolution of the group. If you want to place plants on an evolutionary tree, um, for, for reasons that will become obvious, we can't do so using the tree of the animals because plants aren't animals. Right, so we need to have a bigger tree. So here you can see a tree that I um, borrowed from a 2014 paper that's um, referenced here that is looking at the um, group called the eukaryotes. So this is the group that includes plants, fungi, animals, um, and a series of other often single-celled organisms that have complex cells, things that their cells include, for example, a nucleus and membrane-bound structures called uh, organelles. And you can see that we have a clade here that includes our plants. And plants are closely related to other forms of algae, such as the red algae. So they're here on our tree, somewhere um, in a different clade to the animals and close relatives. So that's where we are on a tree of the eukaryotes when we're talking about plants. And what can I say about plants in a single slide? Well, the plants moved onto land in the Ordovician and then evolved during the Silurian through to today. That move was first enabled by the evolution of water conducting tissues. So um, water, moving water around a plant is a, a key challenge to living life on land. Um, and the other adaptations we see in the plants are also adaptations to life on land. That improve, includes waterproof cuticles, so layers to make sure you don't lose too much water, and stomata, so these are holes by which um, plants um, can respire without losing too much water. And their re the plant's reproductive structures show an increasing number of um, moves away from relying on water um, when it comes to their reproduction. Examples of Silurian plants are shown on the left-hand side here. So this is the one of the first land-known uh, plants, a thing called Cooksonia. Various non-seed-bearing plants arose during the Devonian, and the tree habit first appears during the Devonian period as well. So we have our first um, forests here in the Devonian. 
ferns were established by the Carboniferous. So um, these and other forms related to club mosses, which are shown in the middle uh, of our slide here. This is an example of a, of a tree-like um, club moss and horsetails formed what we call the great coal forests of the um, Carboniferous period. So these coal forests um, are, well, they, they are the, the basis of most of our coal today. They were spread over what is today North America and much of Europe. And it's here that we find these really interesting, cool um, tree-like structures forming that we know from a wide range of fossils. So what this image shows is the, the fact that we have things called form taxa. When people in the Victorian era started describing these organisms, they started by describing the separate parts, such as the root, the trunk, the bark, the branches, the leaves, the cones, and the spores, as different species names. And since that time period, we've come to put all of those together to create a, hopefully a, a fairly decent picture of what these different um, plant species were like as a whole. But just be aware that any individual can have multiple species names associated with it. Um, so the next steps in plant evolution were the evolution of gymnosperm. So that's seed bearing plants. This is a uh, late Permian example um, of a seed bearing plant. And these seed bearing plants diversified in several phases during the Carboniferous and the, the Permian. So here we can see, um, for example, in this period, the evolution of groups such as the cycads. And then there were several diversification phases in the Mesozoic as well, where we start seeing the appearance of conifers, ginkgos, and a range of other groups that are around today. The angiosperms, so that's flowering plants, um, there's an early Cretaceous example of the angiosperms from, the, from China, shown on the far right here, diversified dramatically during the Cretaceous. And they owe their success um, both to the nature of their seeds and their flowers, but also their co-evolution with the animals that pollinate them, so their reproductive um, adaptations. So in a nutshell, that's the evolution of the plants. And I think it, it's fair to say from my non-expert standpoint that this is a, an evolution showing increasing independence from water as time has gone on. So that's the plants. And I wanted to finish this quick run through what we have missed over the course of this module by talking about the fungi very quickly. So fungi are represented by familiar molds and mushrooms, and they are not plants. They're another group of eukaryotes entirely. So you can see some examples of fungi on this slide here. The fungi have a long fossil record, perhaps dating back to the end of the Precambrian period. And I think it's fair to say that they are understudied compared to both the plants and the animals. We could do with more people studying fossil fungi. So if you're interested in going to paleontological research, I think that's a really interesting area to go into. Fungi are classified into a number of different phyla on the basis of their reproductive patterns. And I would note at this point that my middle image here is actually showing, a, 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 is showing lichens. So lichens are fungi, but they're actually a symbiosis between a fungi and a cyanobacterium or an alga. Um, and this is a really common symbiosis that we see around today. And it's possible that this, this symbiosis was already around um, by in the Precambrian period, because we have possible evidence of lichens at about 600 million years ago. So that's really quite early on. That's really interesting. The fungi, as I've said, are not plants, and indeed they're not animals, but they're closely related to the animals. So you can see on this tree here um, that the fungi and the animals are closely related to each other with a series of single-celled organisms, including the sister group of the animals called the coanoflagellates. Um, here in a clade called the Epistocons. So those clade names don't matter, but just bear in mind that fungi and animals are fairly closely related. So that's pretty cool. And the deep origins of fungi are a matter of active research and debate at the moment. It's really cool stuff and research going on in that area. Um, and the, the, one of the reasons that we don't have as much certainty is because telling uh, a fungus for sure in the fossil record is fairly challenging. We definitely have strong evidence of fungi recognized by their specialized reprodu 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 reproductive structures, 
in the Devonian period and then um, lots and lots of evidence for it in the Carboniferous. Um, so one example, one famous example of early fungi is found in the Rhiney chert. So this is a, uh, a chert that's early Devonian in age. That um, It's a silicon dioxide rock where you've had uh, waters from a hydrothermal system inundating an ecosystem and preserving in glorious detail and cellular preservation um, this early terrestrial ecosystem. And in this ecosystem, in the Rhiney chert, we see evidence of symbiosis between land, plants, and fungi. So we have highly branched networks of thin-walled fungal structure, things called hyphae, within rootstalks of plants. And this is an association that strongly resembles one that we see in living fungi that form a relationship with plants. In fact, this is such a widespread association with, um, that we see today between plant roots and fungal filaments that is basically ubiquitous in all land-based ecosystems. And it was already present by the Devonian. It actually plays a key role in the uptake of water and dissolution of nutrients in the roots of modern plants. So we can say that um, when it comes to fungi fossils, we're fairly sure things are fairly similar in many respects to today by the Devonian period, though we do have evidence, uh, potential evidence of earlier fungal structures. I also wanted to mention a thing called Prototaxites. This is a genus of um, of organisms that's found from the Middle Ordovician until the late Devonian period. And for a long time, scientists have argued about what this thing actually was. Putative um, assignations include to towards the, uh, that this thing was related to the conifers, could have been related to the red or brown algae towards the liverworts, or to the fungi or lichenized fungi. And it, we're now fairly sure that this um, genus, uh, an example of this is shown on the right here, um, is um, an example of a terrestrial fossil fungi. So this fossil fungi formed small to large trunk-like structures between uh, up to one meter wide and reaching up to eight meters in height. So I wanted to highlight this because it means that actually these were the largest organisms on land for much of their existence. So for a significant period of time, these terrestrial fungi were really, really important, although we have no um, living relatives that we're aware of, um, certainly that reach this size today. A recent uh, research has actually tied down slightly more tightly where these sit in the fungi tree of life, which I think was quite interesting. And that's it for the groups of organisms that we've missed when we've been studying our invertebrates. I hope that was informative. And I'm gonna see you in the next video where we start looking at microfossils and using these as indicators of the environment. So I'll see you soon.